student. Where she also studies landscape design, botany and ecology. She has a horticulture practice in Bergen County area in which she focuses on designing and installing gardens based on native plants. She is co-leader of the Bergen Passaic chapter of the New Jersey Native Plant Society and co-chair of the Glen Rock Shade Tree Advisory Committee. I'm very pleased to have Elaine speaking for us uh, this afternoon. So here's Elaine. Go ahead, uh, let's see. Oh, you've got the screen on, okay. There we go. Um, Thank you for sticking around, folks. It's been a very, very good conference, and I hope not to disappoint. Um, the, um, what I'm gonna um, talk about today is creating not so much a native plant garden as creating a habitat based on native plants, um, which is how I like to think about it. So as a prologue, I'd like to show you an example of a habitat. This is the garden that surrounds the headquarters of the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference building in Mawa, New Jersey. Um, our orientation, a lot of the chapters of Native Plant Society oriented toward the south of the state. We are very much in the northern part of the state. We're in the Highlands region. We're in the, we're in the hills that lead up to the Highlands and, um, and we have a different ecosystem up here. Um, this uh, building, this beautiful building was a schoolhouse that was um, originally built early in the 20th century and um, the native plant, the, um, the trail conference acquired it about 10 years ago and about five years ago um, they installed this native plant garden. It was um, our chapter also helps to maintain it through one of the volunteer programs at the, um, at the trail conference. Um, I'm going to be talking about how gardens grow, how fast gardens grow. So this is a picture, the year that this was planted, just when it was installed, and in 2009 when it had more than filled in. This is actually quite an extensive area. It's a wetland. There's a river flowing right in back of the building, the Ramapo River. It extends down um, through some meadows and some trees down to the river. Over here, the river curves around. And um, Hubert mentioned at the, um, at the business meeting, he mentioned the mini grants that were awarded this year. And Linda actually won one of them to um, replant the back of the building um, with native ferns. So that's um, an ex example of how um, those, those grants can be put to use. So this sort of shows you how a garden fills in. The garden was designed by um, Rich Pildar and it was intended as a habitat. It's based on native species that are adapted to the wetland site. So the design includes small trees and shrubs and grasses and perennials. It will include quite a lot of ferns in the shady area at the back. And it incorporates the natural features like the rocks and the wetland parts and the river that are, that are um, there in the site. Um, it's, um, there are many, many species of birds and reptiles and mammals. As I mentioned already, there's a turtle habitat and insects um, in this site. We see pileated woodpeckers, we see snakes. It's just, it's wonderful. Um, the maintenance is ongoing, and this is an important thing about any native garden. You can't just put the plants in and then that's the end of it. Um, maintenance is ongoing. There is a program, if you live anywhere near the area, there's a program that the Trail Conference has called Habitat Helpers that you can volunteer for. Um, our chapter kind of takes the lead in helping out with this, but um, there are many volunteers involved. We meet generally two Sunday mornings a month through the growing season, and we do, um, we pull invasives and we divide and move plants and we, some of us take seeds home and, and uh, germinate them at home and, you know, bring them back. So all kinds of things like that. The reason I'm showing you this garden is that it demonstrates the philosophy and the aesthetic I'm going to share with you today. So throughout the season, just an example, um, we, uh, you know, we, we work with spring cleanup, we work with planting, weeding, pruning, trimming plants, and removing invasives. So these are all the things that have to be done in any native plant garden once established. Just a few, very few of the plants that are, um, that are planted here. This came up by itself. This is um, dogbane. 
it's related to milkweed, but it's not a milkweed. And there's a large clump of it that just came up on its own and nobody had ever seen it in the area before. Um, so just, you know, in, um, a verbena. This is um, the giant Rebeccia, I think. I always forget the name of this one. There is a lot of, um, this is probably panic grass because that's the grass that we have the most of. Um, this is, of course, um, Nonagitima, the, the red Monarda. And uh, there's, a, there's a very, very, very great diversity of plants in this garden. Okay, so I'm, by the way, I am gonna stop maybe two times in the, in the middle of the program to sort of mark off sections and to stop for questions. So I think Randy is fielding questions for me. Um, so just to let her know. Um, so what is a habitat? So if we wanna create a habitat, we wanna know what it is. A habitat is the natural home or environment of an animal, a plant, or another organism. So the habitat contains all the resources an organism needs to survive. And those include food, water, and shelter. So this is uh, just a photo I took in Maine last fall. Um, it's along uh, one of the coastal rivers in the mid coast area. And you can see that you've got um, lots and lots of, you've got a diversity of green plants growing. You have water, you have lots of places where animals can shelter. This is an undersea, undersea habitat. And again, you can see you've got plants and animals and um, lots of food supplies and places where creatures can hide. This is a backyard habitat. The idea here is that it, um, even though it is a suburban backyard, it still contains all the things that are included in a habitat. It has food, it has water. I'm not sure if you can see it for me. Um, this part of the screen is hidden by um, by the the icons for the for the um, panelists, but there's a water there's a little water feature over here, and you can see this picture was taken in September. There's lots and lots of food. This is a this is Viburnum opulus, and I hope it's the right one now that um, Linda explained that. And lots of seeds from um, from perennials. This was all lawn. Um, this entire thing was lawn, and it was planted. But as you can see, it looks quite natural. We're going to talk a little bit more about this habitat later on. So that's the definition. Um, if you want to create a habitat in your backyard, you want to think in terms of layers. This is a, a very useful um, schematic drawing. It, it was um, done in Australia. And as you can see, they're not our plants, but it gives you the general idea. You want to have layers. You want to have tall trees. You want to have a mid-level of shrubs and smaller trees. And you want to have an understory with low growing plants and ground cover. You want to have leaf litter. You want to have some rocks. You want to have some, some fallen wood. Um, we can have some problems with this in some suburban areas, but if you do it subtly, you're probably okay. You want to have water. So again, this, um, this schematic shows you all the things that you need to do in a suburban garden to create a habitat. And in this garden, most of those things have been done. So you have shrubs, you have tall trees, you have um, perennials, you have, um, you can't see, underneath here because everything is in leaf, but um, the leaves that fall in this little forest area are never, never swept away. They're just, you know, they just come there. The only thing that has to be done in this habitat back here, of course, you know, the lawn still gets mowed, but um, the only thing that has to be done back here is you have to remove seedlings of invasive plants. This one happens to be surrounded by both English ivy and Norway maples that go to seed into it. So you have to be vigilant to, re to remove the seeds. But once you, um, Linda's talk was wonderful because um, if you're dealing with the same seedlings um, all the time, you do learn to recognize them at the cotyledon stage. And that's very, that's very, very useful. Um, so um, so that's, that's really an, an important skill. So um, you can maintain something like this that was planted. But, um, but that looks very natural now, and that is a haven for all kinds of wildlife. So think as I talk, we wanna think about all these different layers that, um, that go into a habitat. Okay, so ecologists like to say, if you plant it, they will come. And for the most part, it's true. 
and plants are the basis of the food chain for all living things. I think, I think we all know that. That's really true only if you don't use pesticides and if you are focused on native plants. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So you need to think in terms of not only flowers, not only fruit, but all kinds of things that are going on. Um, so, you know, you get adult butterflies nectaring, but what plants did those particular butterflies need to um, need for their larval stage? This one, for example, is a, um, it's a red admiral and it, it nectars on nettles. Now, probably most of us don't plant nettles in our garden. They're kind of a pesky weed, but um, luckily enough for this garden, there is a stream about a block away and um, it's a kind of a wild area and nettles grow there. So these butterflies um, hatch in the, um, you know, they're, 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 they, are, they are caterpillars in the nettles and they have a very short distance to fly to get to this nine bark where you will invariably see them um, in swarms nectaring on this nine bark when it um, blooms in May. Um, habitat can include dead branches, and it very often does. Um, this was a branch, you can see it's a Norway maple, but it's um, a tree that was dying slowly and it had a large dead branch. This was in my front yard. It had a large dead branch that um, existed for many years. And it was obvious that when it fell, it wasn't gonna fall on anybody. It was just gonna fall on lawn. So we left it. And this family of woodpeckers lived in it for years until the branch fell off. The tree is dead now, I'm happy to say. And I planted an oak instead, but it, um, it, um, it, it, it really, it housed that, it housed a family of woodpeckers for many years. And of course, um, you wanna think about the, um, this is a, um, I'm, not a I'm not a birder, um, but um, this hawk very often hangs out in my backyard um, in, the, um, in the winter time. You can see this is actually on a neighbor's, a neighbor's tree. But, um, but you wanna think about what all of these animals are eating and what they need. Um, um, again, if you use pesticides or if you buy plants that are treated by pesticides, you're certainly not going to see butterflies and you're probably not going to see birds either because birds eat the, in, eat, eat the larvae and, um, and the insects. And then if you don't see birds and other small animals, you're not going to see the sky either. So it's all the basis of the food chain, these native plants. Um, you need to cater for the entire life cycle. And again, you need to not use pesticides. <laughs> I think um, Linda talked about this. I think everybody knows about the life cycle of monarch butterflies. I think it's worth repeating that just about every butterfly is that specific. Um, it, may, it may not be a particular genus of plants, but it's certainly going to be a particular family or group of families. Um, this is a female of a spring azure. They lay their eggs on the flowering parts when in bud, think about the life cycle implications, when in bud of certain native species. Um, they use certain shrub dogwoods, shrub viburnums, and this is New Jersey tea. So this is a, a female laying its eggs on the, um, on the flower buds of New Jersey tea. The caterpillars are going to develop here. These, the adults seem to, in my garden, they seem to emerge just before this when some of the shrub dogwoods are blooming in another part of my garden. So those, those adults have, um, have hatched in another part of my garden Then they found this New Jersey tea and they're completing and they're doing another life cycle. Um, they're going along with their life cycle. So very, very important to cater for, um, for the entire life cycle and to different seasons. Um, birds eat caterpillars, just like children need protein, baby birds need protein. And um, you, um, you need to, if you have native plants, you will have a lot of insects laying eggs on them and then you will have caterpillars. Birds will eat the caterpillars and they will be able to raise their young. You wanna have food in the winter too. Just wanna point that out. Um, so you wanna have food all year round in your garden. So you wanna think in terms of layers and you wanna think in terms of seasons when you're planning the garden. Um, again, Linda talked about this. This is the um, very famous research that was done, done by a graduate student of Doug Tallamy's to show that um, a chickadee, a tiny little bird, and I'm seeing them out my window today, a chickadee can only raise a clutch 
of eggs, um, if 70% of the biomass, it's not 70% of the number of plants, it's 70% of the biomass in an area is native because that's the only way you're gonna get enough, um, enough insects laying eggs on your plants and enough caterpillars to feed them. So very, very important to um, that native plants are crucial to habitat. Okay, I just wanna talk very briefly about what is a native plant. Um, I think this is an audience that's obviously interested in native plants and perhaps familiar with, um, with the term, certainly familiar with the term native plants. But I just wanna make sure we're all talking about the same thing. Um, generally speaking, there are other definitions. Um, we're talking about a plant that is native to a particular place and that was here before Europeans arrived on the continent. So it's been here longer than about 500 years. And plants that are native to Northern New Jersey are not necessarily native to Southern New Jersey. The habitats are very different. And there are smaller microhabitats within each of those. Um, it's a plant that evolved here within the native habitat. It's also a plant, so in other words, it evolved with all the same selection pressures as all the other plants and animals around it. It's been eaten and it's been, um, it's been developing poisons to, the, um, to, um, to protect itself against the creatures that eat it. There's a kind of a constant war chemical warfare going on among plants, plants and animals to, um, to stay alive. So it's a plant that has the chemical defenses to, um, to live in this ecosystem. And to my definition, it's a plant that's a member of a pure species rather than a cultivar or a hybrid. So just very quickly, something about nomenclature. When we refer to plants, we want to use the, um, the Latin or the scientific nomenclature, which is um, binomial. This is the genus, this is the species. So Viburnum dentatum, which is right here, is a pure species. If you see something that says, Viburnum blue muffin in single quotes, or Viburnum dentatum blue muffin in single quotes, that's a cultivar. Somebody has either has selected a particular um, genetic line for some particular feature or has developed it in some way. Sometimes it's just selected and it's just something that's a little bit unusual and somebody selected it and continued to grow that plant on um, vegetatively. Sometimes it's, um, it's manipulated quite a bit more than that so that it doesn't look anything like the parent plant. So um, I believe this is blue muffin and it was, it was grown, I think the, the berries are bluer than they are in the pure species, although they're plenty blue in the, in the pure species as well. And then if you see Viburnum X, um, Carlesii or anything, anytime you see an X, you're talking about a hybrid. Somebody combined two different species. So that is um, obviously not a native plant anymore. So I think I'm gonna go real fast here um, because I think, I don't think this, this um, group needs to be con convinced about the virtues of native plants. Why plant native plants? They're beautiful and they tend to be easy to grow if they're sited correctly, but they can be hard to find. That can be a problem. There is a native plant for any site, no matter how difficult. If you have very wet soil, if you have very dry soil, my soil was like beach sand when I started planting. No problem. You pick the right plants for that place. Um, so you can always find, don't tell me you can't find a native plant for your situation. You can. The only exception is if you have fill and not soil. And fill is what happens sometimes after building. They just sort of put in material rather than replacing soil. And that can become very compacted and hard to grow things in. And that, that's a problem, that's not soil. But if you just, if you have soil, there's gonna be plants that can grow in it. Um, native plants are an essential part of the native habitat. Only native plants can feed insects throughout their life cycles. No native plants, no insects. Birds depend on insect protein to feed their young. No insects, no birds. Really, it's very, very simple. So um, we want to plant native plants. How do I know if a plant is native? Um, this can be tricky. Um, you can check the USDA plant database, which is very easy to access online. You can um, go to um, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center 
um, which is wildflower.org and which is an excellent website. Um, the Native Plant Society of New Jersey actually, uh, obviously, has, there are many, many lists of plants for different time, types of habitats on the, um, on the plant, on, in the website, if you just kind of dig around in the website. There's lots of great information there. There's also a website that's more specific to New England, but it's useful too, called Go Botany. Um, so not everybody agrees on on exactly which plants are native to which areas, but there's kind of general agreement about most plants. If you see the word Chinese or Norway in the name, that's a pretty good clue it's not native. So um, if you see, I mean, you very often will see that Korean or Japanese or um, English ivy, guess what? <laughs> it's not native. Um, just to show you, this is, um, Viburnum, um, I've always called it Viburnum um, trifolium, um, or, um, and, um, and I'm sorry, that's what I have always called it. It's, it's trilobum, I'm sorry, Viburnum trilobum, but Randy is saying it's, um, or maybe it was Linda, who said that it's Viburnum oculus, very, very, var oculus. Um, I believe this is the correct one. I've had it in my garden for a long time. This is what the flowers look like. Um, these are sterile flowers that are meant to be showy to bring the insects into this um, cluster of, um, of fertile flowers. The, um, it has, um, if it has a scent at all, it's a very mild scent. Um, most of the viburnums and dogwoods might have a little bit, a little bit of a scent. This is Korean spice viburnum. It's very showy flowers. It's extremely um, fragrant. It is not native. It's not going to do you any good in your garden. It's very pretty, and um, there's no, there's no denying that. But it is not going to be a good part of a native habitat. So look for native plants and look for pure species. What's wrong with cultivars? Um, this is in the center. This is Echinacea, Echinacea purpurea. There's a little bit of disagreement about whether this is actually native to New Jersey or at least northern New Jersey, but USDA says it is, so I'm going to go with it. So this is the species, Echinacea purpurea. Um, it's a, it, it is um, a prairie wildflower, basically, but it is native to the east. It does spread to the east. Um, it grows in um, slightly moist soil, full sun, beautiful, blooms in the summer, starts to bloom around the 4th of July, blooms through the summer, absolutely beautiful. Dear love it, however. Um, and I found that for me, it's, it's very short lived, but it's beautiful and it will attract pollinators and it will make seeds and it will, you know, if it's happy, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful plant. These are all cultivars of Echinacea purpurea. Now, if you're an insect, Insects don't have the same color vision that we do. They have um, all kinds of um, tools in their vision for, for finding the flowers that they're looking for. They look for color um, particularly. And so an insect is gonna be attracted to this orange center. Um, these are the actual flowers. These are actually modified. These are just modified leaves. Um, these are the flowers. These little tiny things are the individual flowers. And, and a, a pollinating insect is gonna be attracted to these. What's going on here? I don't see anything that, that might possibly attract an insect. It looks like all of, the, um, all of the actual flowering parts have just been bred away. They almost don't exist here. Um, same thing here. If an insect is um, looking for orange, and they're, usually, they're very often looking for bright yellow or bright orange, it's not going to find anything to pollinate here. So this is a good, this is a kind of um, extreme example but it's a good example of why you should avoid cultivars. Certainly you should avoid cultivars that change the flower in any way or that change the color of the foliage because if you change the color of the foliage, you're changing the chemistry of the foliage. Um, so any, um, any caterpillar that relies on that plant as a host is not gonna be able to use it. It's unlikely to be able to use it. You can't say definitively that none will, but it's unlikely to be able to use it. So if you see a cultivar, I tend to avoid them. I have a few just because they're a little shorter or a little more upright than, um, than the species and that can be useful, but I look at them carefully and I kind of look for bitten leaves and for um, and to see if they're attracting pollinators in the same way as the species would. And if they're not, I take them out. 
So um, I think that's a good rule of thumb, um, go with the species. So um, growing your own native habitat. Um, we've already discussed what a habitat is. A native habitat is made up of native plants that attract butterflies, birds, and other wild creatures. Anyone with an outdoor space, no matter how small it is, how shady it is, how poor the soil can grow a native habitat. You can do it on a patio with pots. You can do it, um, you obviously you're not gonna grow tall trees, but you can certainly grow a lot of um, perennials and grasses in a, on a patio in pots. Um, and you can do it in a very, very small space. So this is something I like to talk about. This is a three square foot garden. Suppose you have one little sunny spot and um, it's only about three square feet, three, four square feet. Plant one milkweed, Asclepius, one native grass, and this is little blue stem, and one aster, could be any species. This happens to be New England aster, but it could, but it could be any species. And you will have, um, asters attract, um, are a host plant for many, many species of, um, of insects, of butterflies and moths. Um, native grasses are also a host plant for the skippers, which is a very large family of butterflies. And of course, we know that the monarchs are gonna attract the butterflies. You'll also have bloom from just about all of the growing season. You may have a month or so in um, or like late July to early August when neither of these will be in bloom. But this is gonna start blooming late May. For me, I'm in Northern New Jersey. It will start blooming in, around late May. And the, the um, asters are gonna start in August and go through September. This one will certainly bloom from May through July. So there may be a couple of weeks there, but you'll have bloom. You'll have um, really um, great beauty and diversity in your garden, and you will be able to um, attract, you'll do a lot of good for pollinators with three square feet. I want to point something out in the asters. When I was talking before about the cultivars not having um, the right color um, actual flowers, take a look at these, um, at these asters. Again, this is a composite like the, like the um, echinacea that I showed you before. And this, these are the actual flowers. This here, there's many, many, many of them. It's called a composite because there's lots and lots of little tiny flowers in the center there. Notice that the centers, and some of them they're yellow and some of them they're dark. This is telling the insects, don't bother with this one, it's done. It turns a darker color. These are the ones you wanna go to. The yellow is going to attract um, pollinators and particularly yellow in contrast with the purple. So um, asters do this. It's just so cool when you look at it. So they, um, so the actual flowers change color as they mature. These have been pollinated, these have not. Don't waste your time here. Come here, come to me. Um, so again, three square feet, um, beautiful garden. You could do this in pots. They would have to be big pots. Um, these plants have big root systems. Okay, I wanna start with, I wanna get down to the nitty gritty of what you do when you're planning a garden. So the first thing to do is to evaluate your site. Is it wet or dry? Is it sunny or shady? What plants are already present? And what do you want it to look at, to look like? So, so those are some of the preliminary questions that you wanna think about. Um, I just wanted to show you, these are two shady sites. This is part of, a, it, part of my garden. Um, again, I have very dry soil. Um, this is um, a shady garden. It probably gets just a couple of hours of sun. And this was taken in May. Um, this is um, native columbine and our native geranium. And you can see that it's you know, going nutty with bloom here in the shade and in very poor soil. There's some Tiarella back here, but it doesn't spread nicely for me because it likes some moisture soil. There's a lot of ferns here that do really well. And there's a lot of um, asters in here. Now, obviously they're pretty inconspicuous now. These hard shaped leaves are all um, shade loving asters. But um, so this, this very small um, garden that's almost completely shady is going to give you, um, and this is spring, is gonna give you bloom through the whole season. Um, this is a dry site. This is a photo I, talk, I took along the trail um, in Maine, maybe, maybe this past year. And we were there in the fall 
this was quite a quite a moist site. And I have to um, confess that I did ID the species at the time and I don't remember them. Um, if any of the panelists want to type in what the actual species are, that would be great. Um, but this is um, an aster, obviously, and these are ferns and there's some quite a bit of other stuff going on here. Um, and you can see the old stone walls, but this is a moist site. This is a dry site. This is a moist site. They're both shady. This is, um, this is spring, this is fall. So you decide, um, you um, kind of, by evaluating your site, you would know what to plant. Okay, the next thing to do after you've um, evaluated your site is to research native plants. So obviously a good place to start is in our, your native plant societies. Most of you are from New York, or from New Jersey, but every state has a native plant society. If you're in New York, um, Southern New York, you might want to look into the Native Plant Center at Westchester Community College. But as I said, the Native Plant Society of New Jersey has really good information on the website. If you're particularly interested in a pollinator garden, go to the websites of the Xerces Society or the North American Butterfly Association, that's NABA. Both of them have um, lists of native um, pollinator plants, native, um, not all pollinator plants, but, um, but insect and butterfly host plants, at, as well as pollinator plants that are specific for each region of, of the country, excuse me. So if you, that's a very good way to st sort of start. Um, it gives you a whole grouping of plants. For information about bird-friendly gardens, consult the Audubon Society. It's going to give you a lot of the same plants because birds eat insects. So um, the plants that attract insects are the plants that attract birds. One thing that I, I recommend very highly is um, the Peterson Guide to Eastern Forests. It's in the Peterson Field Guide um, um, uh, series. And it tells you which plants grow together in communities. And that's what I like to start with when I'm working with a client. Um, if you look at your trees, if you're in the suburbs, I live in Northern New Jersey where we have older suburbs, we have smaller plots, and really the only thing that's left of the native um, uh, vegetation is a few old trees. Um, if you're lucky enough to still have old trees that aren't Norway maples, when I bought my house, they were all Norway maples because they had been planted in the 50s when the house was built. But, um, but if they, you have older, an older house and older trees, you, um, you may be able to, if you can identify those by species, that will be a very good guide to what can be there. It's a, it's a good start. For example, if you have chestnut oaks and hickories, you've got a dry site. You can look in the Peterson Guide and see what um, shrubs and what understory plants go with that. Same thing if you have red maples, you've got a wet site and you can, um, you can look and, and you can find out what grows under, under red maples. And that's a really good way to start. To get the whole philosophy of, um, of native plants and why we should do this, Doug Tallamy's books are highly recommended. He's a great speaker. There's lots of opportunities to hear him on the web and he's really, done a great job of, um, of showing people how important this is. There was another writer who wrote a couple of books 25 years ago. Um, her name was Sarah Stein and she's passed away. And she wrote two wonderful books. When a few years ago, Linda and I found, Linda Rolander and I found out that we had both been inspired by her 25 years ago. Um, we didn't know each other then, so we had both gotten into this field because of Sarah Stein's writings. She wrote two books. One is called Noah's Garden, and one is called Planting Noah's Garden. Um, and they're all based on her property in Bedford, New York and Westchester, but she is, she's a much better writer than Doug Tallamy. So um, he has great information, but he is not, he's not a writer. Sarah Stein was a writer. Um, he's an entomologist, she was a writer and they're wonderful, wonderful books. Um, so that's, if you wanna really be inspired, I would look for those. They're, avail they're, they're out of print, but they're available. So Sarah Stein, um, Noah's Garden and Planting Noah's Garden. There is um, a native plant database that is searchable at wildflower.org. And that will help you to develop a preliminary list of plants. You can put in, um, you put in your state, you put in what, your, um, what your, um, your site is like, you can put in whether you're looking for trees or shrubs or whatever, you can put in when you want them to bloom and you'll get a list of plants. Um, my dog is scratching and crying outside the door. I may have to get up and let him in, so I apologize in advance. 
Um, okay, design considerations. Um, what should the garden look like? Um, so the, the first thing that I look at, and I very often look, I look at this on Google Maps before I go to the client's house is how much sun this, this site is likely to get and where is the sunlight coming from? Sunlight comes from the south, so that's gonna be the sunniest part of the garden. You wanna plan for a succession of bloom. You wanna think about how tall the plants are. You wanna think about how many plants you might need. And you wanna think about whether you want a formal or an informal look. Now I do a very simple sketch. Um, there is incredibly sophisticated software that you can use. Um, I'm not good, that good with computers and it's very expensive. So I don't use that, but I do lay it out on graph paper. And use, most of the time I'm dealing with fairly small spaces so it can be done this way. So these are two examples. This is um, a foundation planting and this is a freestanding garden. So you can see it indicates where north is this way, so south is this way, so this is getting full sun. It's, it's under here on this one, you can't see it. Um, you, put in your, um, you put in your shrubs, obviously. You wanna know where you're looking at it from. If you're looking, um, if it's a circular garden and you wanna be able to look at it from all sides, you're obviously gonna put the taller plants in the center. Um, this is a circular garden, but the client is gonna be looking at it from this direction and there were some existing shrubs. So we had it facing her house with its back to the street. This is actually a main street here. So it's gonna give her some shading, some, um, some, you know, some privacy too. This garden is a little bit more informal than this garden just because the plants are scattered throughout. Um, the plantings are scattered. In this one, they're grouped in clumps and it's kind of balanced. So it would look a little bit more formal. Um, the, um, this one is also done as a kind of the deer protection. Um, it, uh, it, um, it has the plants that the deer don't like on the outside and the plants that they like the most on the inside. So these are, these are asters and deer love asters and rabbits, everything, everybody loves to eat asters. So they're here, so they're getting the most protection. These are, um, these are native grasses and most of the native grasses don't get eaten. So things are pretty safe. This is, um, this is milkweed. So again, milkweed in most situations does not get eaten. Um, so um, Minarda also doesn't get eaten. So it's kind of protecting the poor. In this one, they're a little bit more scattered you could easily take this and just decide to not scatter the plants. Um, one of the reasons for using graph paper is that you can just count the number of plants you need off of this. You know, one, two, three, four, five, six, and you, you know how many asters to buy. Um, so um, it's uh, the, the way these are set up is that each square is one, is one square foot. So these are very simple, very schematic, you could easily do an overlay. These, these include all the plants. So these don't show you what it's gonna look like in spring versus in May, say versus in August, it's gonna look very different. But you could easily do overlays. You could do one for May, one for July and one for September. And then that would show you whether you had enough color in all seasons. So this is a really good way to, um, to start to get a handle on what you want your garden to look like. Um, the, um, the next thing to do is once you've done that, you want to develop a preliminary list of plants and then you want to prepare the soil. So a good way to do this is to, um, you should be, if, you're, if you want to plant an, a garden in the spring, you should be ordering your plants right now. It's almost too late. Um, I'm going to give you some, some good suppliers um, later, a little bit later in this program and there are others, but plants do sell out. So you want to order. A good way to do this is to, um, if you have to kill the grass, um, if you have to kill the lawn, like these are two examples of where, um, where I helped people kill lawn. Um, you, um, a really good way to do it is to, in the fall, you want to mow your grass as low as it can go. And then you want to put down a nice um, three to four inch layer of mulch. Um, wood chips are fine. Um, this, these are both bark mulch, shredded bark mulch. Um, but you can, you want to put that down, and then in the spring the grass will be dead, and you can, um, you can plant right through it. Um, for the most part, I'm talking about planting seedlings, plants. 
um, plugs or seedlings rather than seeds. And the main reason is that for a fairly new gardener, um, plants are, plants are, and for a fairly small space, plants are the way to go. Um, seeds take, um, seeds have germination requirements as you heard from Randy. Um, also most native plants are perennials, again as Randy said, and they develop very big root systems and that takes some time. So many, many plants will not bloom until the second or the third growing season. And in the meantime, you're gonna have a lot of roots, a lot of weeds coming in. Um, you're also gonna have trouble if you scatter seeds in an area like this, you're gonna have trouble identifying what all those seeds are as they come up and a lot of weed seedlings are gonna come up too. So I do strongly suggest starting with small plants. The, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm being distracted because my poor dog is crying outside the door. Um, the, um, uh, this was, um, this was a, um, a sunny site where the, um, the homeowner just wanted some color and some, um, you know, some like a nice, nice little accent around this lamppost. So we took out most of the plants, we took out lawn, and then I don't remember what this was, but whatever it was, we decided to leave it. And then we mulched the rest of it, and then this is before the plants went in. This was just a friend that I was helping out and her complaint, and it's a very common one, was that her grass looked terrible. Well, the reason her grass looked terrible she had spent tons of money on it. Her grass looked terrible because the yard was shady. Grass doesn't grow well in the shade. So what I suggested she do is, um, again, we mulched it. We mulched a big area. You can see the area that was originally planted around this tree with hosta, and it, it still remains. But um, we mulched a much bigger area. And um, she didn't take my advice about what to plant, but, um, but um, this is a friend, it's okay. So she planted a lot of um, sun-loving annuals and she, she divided some hosta, but she also took some nice ferns from the back. But, um, but this is going to, um, it's, it's going to do, um, fill in much better and look much better than grass under this tree where you have deep shade. So um, these are just two examples, sun and shade of how you kill lawn. You're gonna, if you look into how to kill lawn, you're gonna find lots of stuff on the web about this. You're gonna hear about the lasagna method. You're gonna hear about solarization. I can tell you mulching works. It's much simpler <laughs> and mulching works. Um, and then you can dig a nice trench um, around the outside. And to some extent, it'll keep the grass from encroaching, but the grass is always going to encroach. You're always gonna to have to weed the edges. Um, the, um, so that's about killing the grass. So you're obviously gonna measure the area to determine square footage. For perennials, grasses, and ferns, you generally wanna think about one plant per square foot. For shrubs, um, up to nine square feet, um, depending on um, depending on the mature size. I want. I have to let my dog in. I'm really sorry. I have to get up and let him in. All right. What do you want? Sorry, guys. <laughs> He's going to be quiet now. Um, the, um, I'm going to go back to the other picture. Okay. As you can see, these are um, larger shrubs and I'm allowing about nine square feet. These are smaller shrubs and I'm allowing about four square feet. And those numbers are just because those are square numbers. Um, you, can, you can put things as close together or as far apart as you want. Um, close spacing is better ecologically and it's better in terms of weed control. I tend to, I tend to like to plant close. Um, the, um, this is, you know, you really don't want this kind of a look with a few plants and a sea of mulch. Um, I'm going to show you some examples of what things look like when they grow up. Um, so that's, that's how you, this is planning. The next thing is to find the plants, which can be the hardest part. And I'm going to give you some nurseries to, um, I'm going to suggest some nurseries to you. And um, then order early because nurseries do sell out. I'm going to stop for questions. I'm not done, but I'm going to stop for questions, but I'm going to use the, leave this slide up while I stop for questions. Thank you, Randy. There you are. So, uh, I'm here. I've been here the whole time. I know, I know you have. Um, just, just didn't want to distract with me, with me shaking my head endlessly, you know, because it's I, what I do. So, um, these, are some, um, these are some excellent mail order sources of native plants. That's Randy's company right there. And um, these are all um, places that... Um, 
have affiliations with the Native Plant Society in one way or another, except for, um, I think, except for Pollination and Izel. Izel is a new company that um, what they do is they aggregate the, um, the inventories of a bunch of native plant of wholesale nurseries that otherwise wouldn't be available to us. And I ordered from them in the fall and got some very good, good quality plants for the first time. I don't usually, I don't like to recommend places that I have never used myself. So um, if you want to take a picture of this slide or um, you know just write these down, this will be up while we're answering questions. So I'm... Um, ready to do that. All right, we've got a lot of questions, Elaine. Uh, so how long did you want this this break to be? I don't know how much more you want to speak. I'm supposed to go, to go till four. So I don't know, 10 minutes or so. All right, let's have that can... much. I know I'm, we're, we're more than halfway through, I think. Let's see what we can get through here. Um, um, all kinds of interesting questions. So there were several questions about um, cultivars. Uh, Rutgers has developed some cultivars of both dogwoods and uh, something called celestial. I don't know what that is. Um, I, I don't want to put you on the on the uh, on the. Uh, no, I'm not to say anything derogatory mm -hmm. about Rutgers, but are Rutgers cultivars any better than, better than anyone else's cultivars? For any reason? I don't know, but I don't see why they would be. All right. Okay. Now, now the Mount Cuba Center um, also does um, test there in Delaware. It's a native plant center in Delaware, and they test cultivars. I am not that familiar with it, but they seem to just test them for pollination. In other words, so far, so far I think that's most of the research yeah, they're doing. Yeah, right and that's now. not all you want. That's not all of it. So I would say that's not good enough to know that a plant, um, that a cultivar attracts lots of pollinators. That's good, but it's not good enough because you want the, um, the value to the, um, to the larval stage of the insects and you don't know if you're getting that. I would stand by my statement to avoid cultivars. If, um, if you possibly can. All of, these, um, all of these people are gonna supply you with pure species. And the other thing that's very important is you want to buy plants that are not pre-treated with um, any kind of systemic pesticides, particularly the neonicotinoids. And, I can't, and these will not be. It's very, very important. Um, if, why buy something that's systemically treated? It's gonna kill the insects that you're trying to attract. Um, you, you need to think about that. Um, plants that you buy in big box stores will almost always be treated. Um, so yes, go ahead. <laughs> um, a, a question um, to the point of cultivars. Um, so, and I'm, go I'm going to editorialize a little bit on this question if I'm allowed, Elaine. I think someone Absolutely. misunderstood Doug Tellamy. Uh, someone writes in here, I heard Doug Tellamy say that he believed cultivar cultivars were equally beneficial to insects as the pure natives. Do you disagree? Um, I would uh, say if I recall what he said was mm -hmm. cultivars are always better than non-natives, but straight species are always better than cultivars. That's yeah. what I remember him saying. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And it also would depend on the cultivar. Um, they're, they're not, they were not, they're not created equal. No, no. Um, uh, there was a, there was another question. Uh, someone, I'm combining several questions here. Someone commented that uh, Go Botany lists the uh, cranberry viburnum that does have two different scientific names. It it has changed over time. Um, so the uh, viburnum opulus uh, americanum is listed by Go Botany as only native as far south as I forget where they said somewhere in New England. I actually answered them and said that Bonap, which is the Biota of North America project, listed native all the way down to West Virginia. Um, and Bowman's Hill says, another person says here that a few years ago, they switched to using Bonap instead of the USDA. The question is, there are differences between all of these. What do you think of those differences? And can you comment on that? I really I really can't comment. And I should have mentioned Bonap, but um, I, I can't comment. There is there is disagreement about what is native to specific areas, and particularly in New Jersey, where the the plants of the nor northern New Jersey are very different from the plants of southern New Jersey. We are we are in different ecosystems and different different eco regions. So um, you have to. <laughs> It's, it's very hard. Um, I would say it may be safer to go by um, 
by assemblages of plants. So you know that if you have, for example, again, chestnut oaks, they, they're common up here, chestnut oaks, um, which tend to grow along with hickories, um, you're probably pretty safe in going to a resource that tells you what grows under those in nature and sticking with those plants. Plants are moving too. With global warming, plants are, pl plants are moving north. So resources become added. It's this is very hard. This is this is not something that you can say it's black and white and you're and you can be absolutely sure. But what we can be sure of is that you know a cultivar that has eliminated the flat the floral center is not going to attract pollinators. And a cultivar that has red leaves instead of green ones is not going to attract um, um, uh, caterpillars or you know butterflies to lay their eggs. And that a plant that is from um, is from Norway is not native. So it's it's hard. Plants from the mountain west, by the way, are not native. They are they are totally different. That, that's almost a different continent. It's more different than Europe is from, from our plants. <laughs> so Elaine, you mentioned an oak and uh, somewhere in your presentation, you actually mentioned about putting in an oak and someone asked if uh, oaks were particularly preferred native plants. Oaks are particularly good native plants. They are, um, and Doug Tallamy um, lists how, um, how valuable plants are to um, different numbers of, of insects and oaks absolutely top the bill of woody plants. Um, I think over 500 caterpillar species, um, you know, Le Lepidoptera species use, um, use oaks as their host plant. Now there are many, many oaks. It's hard to identify oaks because they hybridize freely. Um, but in general, um, there are white oaks and red oaks, and there are oaks of wetlands, and there are oaks of, 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 of dry lands, and there are, um, there are many oaks. So again, look at, your, um, look at your soil, look at what your garden is like, and then pick a plant that's right for your garden. Um, don't, you know, don't plant a, a chestnut oak if you are, if you have swampy soil, plant a swamp white oak instead. So it's just, it's uh, sometimes the name will tell you that, but, um, <laughs> but you do, you have to do a little bit of research. There are many, many, many oaks. Um, let's see, uh, you, you were, when you were talking about the pond, um, and I, and I loved your use of, of Ride Australia's habitat uh, illustration there, that was lovely. Um, if someone said, if you're not going to have a pond. If you don't have space for a pond, would a heated bird bath be an equal substitute? I don't have a pond. I have a, I have a bird bath. I don't know if you could you could maybe not see it on my screen. The um, the little the little squares that show the panelists was covering that part of my screen. It might have been covering yours too. But um, yeah, I have I, a bird bath is a very good thing to have um, that will serve the needs of the birds. You have to keep it clean though, um, because in the summer mosquitoes will breed in it if you don't flush it out every couple of days. You want to flush it out um, if it's if it doesn't circulate the water or you know and bring in clean water by itself. If it's just a a, you know, a bird bath sitting there, you've got to flush it out. And that's all I have. I just have a bird bath. But um, yeah, so it will work very well. And I don't heat it in the winter, I have to confess. Mine is not heated either. Um, let's see. Uh, you, you had a beautiful slide early on of dog bane, and someone was, um, they were concerned. They thought that dog bane was considered a thug that quickly crowds out natives. It hasn't been the experience. The only place I've seen it is in the garden at, um, at the trail conference headquarters and it came up on its own and, um, and it is spreading, but it seems to be, be behaving itself very nicely. It's in one spot. Um, we've been trying, in fact, trying to um, collect seeds and grow it because uh, you know everybody likes it. So um, I'm not aware of it as a thug. To me, a thug is white snake root. <laughs> so to me, that's, that is the worst thug. It's native and it's, a terrible thug, and in, in, um, that's in, in dry places. In, in uh, wet places, mist flower is a, is a native that can be a thug. So, um, you know, some plant, and it, it depends on the other plants. You know, there are plant interactions going on all the time. You don't always get what you expect. You may get a, a plant that's, that's thug-like in some circumstances and not in others, depending on what's around it, depending on the soil, depending on what insects are eating things. There are lots of factors going on. You can always keep an eye on things and you know pull them out if they uh, or or keep cutting them back if if they are um, thud like they start to behave thud like. I uh, just a, a little personal point on the uh, dog bane is um, you know it it will send up friends many many feet away, um, but a it can be completely controlled by a lawnmower. I'm here to tell you, 
um, and they don't really grow that close together. So it it, it mixes well in, in my experience as well. Yeah. Yeah, um, it seems to play well. At the um, at the trail conference garden, it's um it's surrounded by hardscaping. So there's really nowhere that it can it can't really come up very far away. So uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So here's a really great question um, that just came in a few moments ago. Um, up to are, can you recommend any up to date books on plant communities of New Jersey? Uh, something more recent than the vegetation of New Jersey, uh, which is getting, you know, by Carl Anderson and, and Robert Shaw, that's been that's getting rather rather old at this point on the shelf. Was there anything new? I think you might be able to answer this better than I can, Randy. And I don't have an answer for it either. I was hoping okay. you did. <laughs> I use um, I do use the Peterson Guide for Plant Communities. Well, yeah. I also have a I have a big fat reference to um, and this has been around for you can it's backwards for you guys. Native trees, shrubs, and vines for urban and rural America. Yeah. And this shows the um, it's very good information. It has not been updated recently. It was very expensive, and it. Um, it does show um, the other trees that grow around the trees in nature. Um, yeah, I, I but, don't know of another yeah. specific one to New Jersey though that's come out. Yeah, and the um, and it's true the Peterson's Guide to Eastern Forests does not cover the Pinelands well. No, it doesn't. covers the the north, you know, the more of the forests of the northern part of the state. Um, it, it's really not a good. I would imagine that there's a lot of stuff online about the Pinelands, though. There's a lot of good stuff. I'm not really familiar for the with the Pinelands. I had seen, I saw them for the first time last fall. My husband and I went down to Cape May for a few days. I'd never seen them before. It's so different from up here, and I just spent hours and hours botanizing. I was fascinated, but. It's, it's just, um, there's good stuff online from um, various parks and, um, and various county stuff. Um, I would think that's a good place for, um, to start to, um, to research the southern plants. Well, Elaine, that was about a 10 minute break. Did you want to jump back into the rest of your presentation? No, why don't we, can... we go on? I'm going to show this slide okay. of, the, um, of the sources again at the end. Okay. So you, can, you guys can take a picture of it or just write down the names of the places. Okay. Okay, there was the questions. Okay. This is to give you an idea of how fast these plants grow. This was a demonstration garden that I did in front of Borough Hall here in Glen Rock. There was this, this long, ugly garden that was planted with impatience every year in full sun. It's giving me a break. So I, um, I asked if they would sort of cordon off an area for me, or Department of Public Works. And I, this was about, I don't know, maybe six feet square. And I planted a few little divisions from my garden in April. So these were planted in April. You can still, there's, still see there's still some tulips and things in here. Um, there, um, this is what it looked like in April. Again, this is small divisions from a garden. Seedlings would not grow quite as fast, but um, if you can get divisions from somebody else's garden, this is what will happen. This is what it looked like in early June. You can see penstemon. And um, this is um, lance leaf uh, coreopsis, coreopsis lanceolata is already blooming. So early June, it planted in mid-April, early June, early October. It went nuts. So um, this is the first, the first season, what you can expect from divisions. So things will fill in pretty quickly from divisions, not quite so quickly from seedlings. But if you had planted seeds, you might have some milkweeds will be six inches tall the first year, at the end of the first season. They may possibly, in some cases, bloom toward the end of the second season. They won't bloom on time, but everything will bloom by the third year. A lot of things will bloom late in the second year. Very few from seed will bloom the first year. And you have the problem of plants being very tiny and, um, and being hard to identify and easy to weed out because it's hard to tell. So this is the kind of growth you can, you can expect. Um, this was not, um, we didn't do anything to the soil. Um, this does have a sprinkler system, but um, at home, I don't have anything like that. Okay, care of a native plant garden. Um, you basically don't want to um, baby these plants. You don't want to pamper them. Most plants will need supplemental water during dry periods for their first growing season only. Um, and that's for the perennials and grasses. For the, and this is all, this is all with the caveat that you've put the right plant in the right place. 
if you've put wetland plants in a dry site, you're going to have to water them forever. So that's why you don't want to do that. If you have a dry site, plant things that like a dry site. Um, if you've chosen the right plants for your site, you should not have to water after that. Woody plants are a little bit different. If you plant shrubs, um, so for perennials and grasses and things, you're really talking about planting during the growing season. You could probably stop and fall. They're going to be well established by then. They're going to have nice root systems. Um, for woody plants, they take longer. If you plant shrubs, you should certainly plant, you should certainly water throughout the entire year, as long as the ground isn't frozen. Like this year, it was I'm in the north, we still have six in inches of snow on the ground. I think it's a little different for the people who are in the south. So if I had new, new woody things in, in the ground now, I wouldn't be watering them. But, um, but if the ground were not covered and, um, I, I, and, it, and it wasn't frozen as has happened in many seasons recently, I would be watering them. Um, you, should, um, you shouldn't have to, um, you should water shrubs certainly for an entire year and trees you wanna water for at least a complete year per inch caliper. So if you plant a tree with a two inch trunk, you wanna water that tree during dry periods for at least two years. Um, trees take a long time to establish and the main reason they fail is for um, insufficient watering. So, um, so that's water, don't overwater. Um, I do not have sprinklers and I never water my garden. Um, some plants that are supposed to be um, wetland plants do just fine in dry soil. Um, Asclepius incarnata, which is called swamp milkweed, does fine. My soil, as I said, was like beach sand when I started growing. Also, um, it, it grows just fine. This is, um, this is one of our candidates for a plant of the year. In fact, I think I nominated it. This is hibiscus mosquitoes. And it is a wetland plant. That's where you'll see it in nature, growing in, um, in very wet areas, does fine. I have to pull seedlings and give them away all the time. It does just great in my, in my dry soil. So you never know. And again, I don't water. These plant, you, plants are tough, they can take it. You don't want to use pesticides or herbicides and you want to beware of purchasing plants treated with systemic pesticides. Obviously, if you have an invasive problem, you want to address that as carefully as you can, and Linda gave some guidelines for that. Um, but um, you don't want to use any kinds of chemicals. If your whole point is to create a habitat, you certainly don't want to use pesticides at all. Um, plants should not use fertilizer or any type of soil amendment. Um, as I said, um, if you if you try to dig in your soil, and you can do soil testing if you want, you send it off to Rutgers, you can do soil testing, it'll tell you all kinds of things. For the most part, um, these, um, these very hardy native plants can grow in just about anything. I mean, there are, there are specialized plants for specialized types of soils, but if you have just general garden soil or even something that's very sandy as we tend to have up here in the north, um, most of these plants will do, will do fine. Um, so they don't need fertilizer. I have never, ever put anything in my, in my garden. Um, um, and you don't want to clean up the garden in fall. This is very important. You want to wait until new growth appears in spring. And the reason for this is that that's when it's actually most effective at feeding wildlife in the winter. The, um, a lot of insects, um, a lot of our bees are solitary creatures and they live either in the ground, they don't live in hives like honeybees, they don't live in colonies like honeybees, they live either in the ground or they live in stems of plants or they live in, in dead wood. So if you leave the stems standing, that's, those are winter homes for insects. Another reason is um, if you leave the plant standing, the seeds are gonna be there. You can collect some, that's not a problem, but the seeds are gonna be there and the birds are gonna eat the seeds all winter. And that's your bird feeder. I have um, mixed, mixed species foraging flocks coming through my garden on a daily basis. And they're, um, you, you'll tend to see like um, nuthatches and chickadees and a couple of species of sparrows and um, 
and juncos. Those are the most common ones, but they come through in, in groups um, and they're called mixed species foraging flocks. And they forage at different levels that they come through in a group together. And they'll some of them will forage on the tops of the plants and some will be on the ground, the way like robins sift through leaves. So you don't wanna, you don't wanna clean anything up because that's all food. That's where the, um, the butterflies, a lot of butterflies are gonna overwinter and they look just like dead leaves. So when they fall to the ground, you wanna leave them. Um, very, very important not to, not to clean up. And um, people ask when you should clean up. I've seen when it's, when it's routinely 50 degrees in the daytime. What I do is I wait until I see new growth on most of the plants in an area, and then I clean up. So here's a slide about that, about garden cleanup. And this is just a small section of a perennial border. Um, you can see this is what it looks like after um, um, in, in uh, early spring, late winter, it's been, it's had snow on top of it, the grasses and things are, you know, they're, they're low to the ground, but there's still some seeds and things and you can see there's some new growth. So what I do is I go in there, I try not to, not to walk on it as much as I, you know, try to avoid walking on it as much as I can, but um, so I'll go in through one particular path all the time. But you go in and you take a handful of stalks and you just snap them and they break off extremely easily. So um, you wanna break them a little high. Um, if they're really thick stalks, you might wanna break them maybe two feet or so. If they're thinner, you could break them, you know, nine inches a foot. Um, you wanna break them off. And then I dump them on a, on a tarp, um, as you can see here. I just um, snap them off and I break them, I put them on the tarp. And then when I'm done, taking the tall growth off, then I'll take a, a, a rake with a very wide, um, very wide between the teeth and just very gently rake. I don't wanna remove everything. There's no reason to remove everything. You just want the plants to have room to grow. And then this is all compostable. Um, I don't have room to compost it. So we take it to our town composting center. If you have room, certainly you can compost all that. Um, that's, um, and that's, that's garden cleanup. This is really the most care, the most, um, uh, the most intensive care that a native plant garden requires. Okay, okay, there's a place to stop for questions or should I just go on because we're almost done? I think I will. And then, so I, save your I questions think just, and I'll finish. I what think just go ahead, Elaine. Yes, I'm going to, okay. These are just some examples of plantings you can do. This is exactly the same spot in a perennial border and the pictures were taken in June and in early September. It's the same spot. You wanna plant thickly. So in June, as you can see, orange butterfly weed, which is a milkweed, sun drops, Anothera fruticosa, and, um, and uh, uh, Minarda. And Minar this is um, Minarda fistulosa, the pink one, the pink or purple one, are in bloom. This is um, little blue stem, and this is what it's gonna look like in September, but this is what it looks like in June. It's sort of barely up. Um, by, the, by the fall, in the same spot, and I haven't done anything, I haven't removed anything, um, the, um, this Rodbeckia has taken over and, and the little blue stem. And if you look in back, you'll see um, there are asters and there's Boltonia in back. So again, same spot. And this is what happens from June to October. These are established plants. These are not, these are not new plantings. Um, things move around in a, in a native plant garden. Um, things are not exactly the same this year from last year. It's not going to look exactly the same. Um, something might have pushed something else back. The deer in some years are more active than others and you, and some things don't bloom. But um, in general, um, if you, you sort of, if you mix your plants and you'll have something going on all the time. Very easy to grow plants for sunny sites. Um, most of these uh, will do fine in, in somewhat, well, not all of them, I'll point those out. Um, so um, this is another Monarda. This is Monarda didyma, which has red flowers. Um, this is New England aster. New England aster is considered to be um, a plant of moist sites. Again, does fine in my dry soil. This is um, blooms, bloom, this blooms say in August, September. This blooms uh, June, July. This is a picture taken around the 4th of July. So again, you have um, orange butterfly weed, um, Asclepias tuberosa, 
which it is, it must have a dry site. This is one of those plants that really will not do well if it's sited incorrectly. It has very thick tuberous roots and they just rot away in a moist site, but it does fine in a, in a dry site. And um, uh, this is uh, Sundrops or Mathera fruticosa. Where you see this growing in the wild, I think the only place I've ever seen it in the wild was in clefts between rocks along the seashore in Maine. So that's how tough and hardy a plant this is. Um, this is little blue stem in June. This is little blue stem in probably in late July when it's blue. When it blooms, um, it actually is blue and it's quite beautiful. Little blue stem is also a plant of dry soil and, um, and poor soil. Um, if you have a richer soil or a moister soil, you might want to try a different grass as a foundation, such as a prairie, do prairie drop seed, perhaps, or panic grass, which do better in, um, in richer soil and moister soil than little blue stem does. Again, little blue stem, if you see it in the wild, it's gonna be, you're gonna have climbed a mountain and you're gonna see it on top of a rocky ball growing between the cliffs of the rocks. This plant has already been shown to you today and it is um, Anis hyssop. Um, this is Agastache funiculum. It's the, the smaller of the two. This is the only one of the two that I grow. And this one has a licorice um, every part of it has a licorice smell and taste, and you can actually eat the flowers. They're very strong tasting, so you want to put little tiny bits in a salad. And this was the first time I ever saw a buckeye in my garden when um, it, was on, um, it was on this one. Um, this is, I've already shown you this, um, this echinacea. I might have called it Rebecca before. It's, um, it's echinacea purpurea, um, which for me is a tricky plant to grow. This is um, my favorite of the Rodbeckias um, by far. This is um, a short-lived perennial. It's um, Rodbeckia trilobum, and it is about, gets to be about four feet tall, and it blooms like this. It's just unbelievable. It blooms like this from about maybe the beginning of August and through, through to frost. Um, and it's fairly short-lived, but it self-seeds very readily, but without becoming thuggish. It's a really nice wood becky. Um, I find it extremely easy to grow. These are all for sunny sites, obviously. I can't, obviously there are thousands of plants. I can't possibly show you all of them. I'm showing you just a few readily available, easy to grow plants. I showed you this picture before. This is a border that's mostly in shade in May, and it's dominated by our native geranium, geranium maculatum, which is a spring ephemeral. Um, it comes up early, it blooms, and it disappears. And columbine. And columbine is one of the one, one of the few places where I see hummingbirds in my garden or in my area. And the native columbine, which blooms in May, just, just about. I guess just as the migration is happening, it's, it's blooming. So I will see hummingbirds in these guys. Um, this is a, a, another plant of dry areas because it has a taproot. You know, a taproot, think of a carrot. Um, and they uh, taprooted plants tend to be plants of dry areas so that the roots don't rot. Um, very easy to grow plant as long as you don't move it when it's mature, it doesn't like that. Taprooted plants don't like to be moved. Um, some other easy to grow plants for shade. There's your geranium again. This down here is our native Pachysandra. Um, again, I believe some references say that it's only native in the Southern Appalachians, but again, we're thinking about things moving north. Um, the the Pachysandra that most people are, are uh, familiar with is very straight up and down the Japanese Pachysandra. This one is um, Pachysandra procumbens or sometimes it's called Pachysandra alleghaniensis, and it's gracefully procumbent, and um, it mixes beautifully with ferns. This is an area that gets almost no sun. It's on the north side of a building, almost no sun. And then this Pachysandra, when um, in the winter, turns beautiful bronze colors, and you can sort of just see it here, but this is new foliage. But, um, but by winter, it's, um, the foliage stays all year, and it has this beautiful bronzy tones in the winter. The, um, this is Tiarella, of course, which um, I can't remember who talked about it. Somebody talked about Tiarella, which is a great ground cover, but you need a little bit more moisture. Um, it needs a sort of a moderate, a moderate soil, a nice mesic soil. This is Jacob's Ladder. 
This is our geranium again, which as you can see does really well in, um, in dry sites. This is um, false Solomon seal. Uh, it's myothenium, I can't remember the species. Um, false Solomon seal, not, not um, true Solomon seal. Um, false Solomon seal will, will do well in a drier site than, um, than the true Solomon seal. We have down here two, um, an aster and a goldenrod of dry shade. This is, um, this goldenrod is um, crooked stemmed goldenrod. And I do not remember what this aster is and I'm sure somebody looking at it will, will be able to tell you, I'm sure Randy knows. Um, and this is a plant that I think you should not ignore. This is um, a common violet. Um, people very often ask me how to get rid of violets. And what I try to answer politely is, why do you want to? Um, I don't feel that polite about it, but I try to be polite. <laughs> um, the um, violets are the only host plant. There are many species of violets. This is, I believe, Viola sororia, and it grows wild all over, um, all over up here. But it, um, it likes part shade. Um, it will grow almost anywhere. It grows in your lawn. It grows in your beds. It, um, it is the only host plant for the fritillaries, which is a very large um, and very beautiful family of butterflies. So um, encourage them. If not, um, what they very often do is they'll just sort of form an understory in your um, um, in your perennial beds. So you won't see them once the plants grow up. There are a number of native plants that do this. Um, I have a sink foil that does this too in, in my garden. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, don't, don't think of them as weeds. Think of them as things that are holding the soil in place and perhaps um, attracting very early pollinators before your perennials grow up. So just a selection of, um, of pretty easy to grow plants for shade. Again, um, we'll answer questions again, but here is um, that, that slide of um, sources again, if you are interested. So thank you for all very much for your attention. It's been a long day for, uh, for, for everybody. I don't know, like you, me, you probably got up and did some exercises in between. <laughs> so, uh, but um, yeah, so I'm happy to take some questions now for a while. Thanks so much, Elaine. That was really great. We, we do have a bunch more questions. Okay. So um, no exercising yet. I think the, the very last question, which I'm not going to go to yet, but before you leave, everyone wants you to show your dog. So I'll just get that out of the way <laughs> right away. People want to know what the dog looks no, like. He's sleeping now. So. But, but, but be that as it may. Um, so, uh, and that was white wood aster, by the way. Eurybia Thank didiricata. You. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, Here's a really easy question. Uh, can you grow perennials and native perennials in window boxes? Sure, yeah. Um, as long as you allow for the size of the root system, yeah. Um, so like for example, shorter perennials that don't have, that don't have tap roots, um, you know, think about it that way. Um, think about if, if, it, if the plants aren't too tall, they're pro they probably have slightly smaller root systems. Maybe something like Coreopsis and um, grasses might be difficult because they do tend to have very long, uh, very big root systems. But yeah, you should be able to do that. I grew dwarf crested iris in window boxes for years when I wow. was in graduate school. Mm -hmm. Looked wonderful. Okay, there you go. Mm -hmm. How to encourage the violets to grow and spread? Uh, huh, usually they don't need encouragement. They tend to like, um, there are many species and Randy, I think, has given whole talks about violet species, and she really knows this stuff. And she sells many different species in her in um, on her site. Um, so that's something you might want to look into. I would imagine that different ones are adapted to different types of soil. This particular one that I showed you is one that's all over the place here. There probably are different ones. They tend to like um, at least part shade, not full sun. Um, I would, you know, take some from a neighbor and, you know, and put them in a spot and encourage them to spread. Um, well, um, when I when I was first gardening, I didn't let my my husband is my is my mower now, but at the time I had somebody who mowed, and I didn't let him mow over the violets until they were, um, you know, until they were um, really done blooming. Um, you know, so maybe um, in that way you'll encourage them to set seed. Um, but usually they don't need a lot of encouragement. I would just buy some, start by buying some and, and experiment with them. Um, 
question from, from Jay Kretz, actually. Are the costs of Norway maples, firebush, and butterfly bush, I ask selfishly, he says, high enough that cutting established specimens, which are helpful with soil erosion, etc., appropriate? I'm always reluctant to cut down plants that are established. Yeah, I, that's a hard thing. I um, It's a hard thing. I Things that are um, butterfly bush, which is really invasive, it's becoming very, I would take that out. Big trees are more problematic for, for many reasons because they are sequestering carbon. One lucky thing about Norway maples is that here on this continent, they have a short lifespan. So uh, they have much longer lifespan where they're native. So they tend to have, um, they tend to die after 60 or 70 years at most. So I, when we bought our house, we, we had four big Norway maples. They're all gone now. We waited till they died. They're all gone and we've replaced them with native trees. Um, obviously those trees are smaller, but yeah, I wouldn't, I mean, you have to, I mean, obviously if you're going to cut down big trees, it costs a lot of money. So that's a consideration there. So um, definitely I would take out, I didn't take, I'm not sure what the third one was, but you mentioned butterfly bush and Norway maples and uh, 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 fire bush. Uh, I think it's burning bush. The, burning, the, I would, oh, I would definitely take that out. Yeah. I would take out the smaller plants. I would, for the trees, I would carefully remove seedlings when I saw them. And I did that for years and I still do it because my neighbors still have them. But, um, <clears throat> because Norway Naples do seed pr very prolifically. But um, there, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a trade-off. It's a trade-off. And as, um, uh, as we heard this morning, um, you know, they are sequestering a lot of carbon and the bigger tree, the better, the better job it's doing. So um, I did, in my case, I waited till they died. Well, I used a few of mine for firewood, I have to confess, because we had them here when I moved in too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Let's see, uh, there was a question that, that came up early on, actually, um, just throwing it out to anyone. If anyone knows how deer repellents affect the insects or birds who feed on the plants that were sprayed. I, I don't know anything about that. What I do about deer and, um, and rabbits, we have a lot of rabbits too. So um, we are in a very, we are in um, an old suburb and plots are small, but the deer go, they walk down Main Street in Glen Rock. So uh, we, have, we have a lot of deer. Um, I pray for very cold winters because it kills off the deer. Last year was terrible because we had a really warm winter. So I had species that didn't bloom because um, the deer just continually, like I had one aster that bloomed last year, all, and I have tons of them, but one bloomed because the deer were just continually eating them down to the ground. Now they didn't die, but they, but they didn't bloom. Um, one thing that you can do that is pretty effective, although last year I have to say the deer ate milkweeds and they ate some of the mints, which you'd never see. Um, I had, there was, the pressure was just so high. They ate things I've never known them to eat before, uh, really the milkweeds. So, um, but um, what I do is I try to surround the plants that they like the most, like a favorite um, deer love Phlox paniculata, a lot of critters do, and, and the asters. I try to surround them with the plants they don't like. And I showed you that in that diagram where the, the non-tasty plants were on the outside of, um, of the diagram. You, um, you know, they, a lot of the native grasses, uh, they don't eat. Um, milkweeds in general, anything in the mint family are fairly safe. So I try to hide the plants they do eat among the ones they don't. I also spread them around. So this is another, sort of vote in favor of an informal garden, I spread things around because if you put in a nice, beautiful clump of phlox as a focus in your garden, it's not gonna be there very long. So, um, and also um, one thing about deer is that they tend to eat different things in different areas. There is a list of deer resistant plant, native plants on the um, NPSJS um, NJ website. But some of them are different up here than they are, you know, for the person who did that list in a different part of the state. I don't know if it's cultural or what, if the mommies teach the babies, you, you know, this is good to eat and this isn't. But oh, um, I think so. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. But, um, but it, it differs in different areas. So a lot of this is experimentation. But, but last year when we had that very mild winter, really, I, I lost, I think maybe one or two plants I might have lost entirely, um, one or two species and other things just didn't bloom. 
and just got repeatedly eaten down to the ground. And they really did eat milkweeds and, and, um, and mints, which I had just never seen before. So they were hungry. Yeah, so, uh, you know, you want to, this winter, I'm hoping, I don't know uh, what you had down south, but we had a lot of snow on the ground for a long time and we still do. So I'm hoping, that, uh, and we, it's been colder than usual. So maybe we'll have a better, a better gardening season. So I think I might've gotten off topic there a little bit. There's, there's a couple of questions here that I'm gonna to try to roll into one. Um, someone wanted to know about using, uh, well, first to back up, a few people suggested with Norway maples, just um, topping them and then leaving the base to rot and let the woodpeckers enjoy them. Mm -hmm. But moving oh, on yeah. from that, that was just a suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, some folks about starting new gardens. Um, I'm gonna give you three parts to this question, Elaine. Um, one, how about killing the grass with cardboard? Two, is it too late this spring to remove your grass and start a new garden this year? And three, uh, do you, you said you don't add anything to your garden. Do you add, add even compost to a new garden or do any top dressing with compost? No, I don't. Um, I don't add anything at all. I do make compost, but I use it only on my vegetables. I don't use it on my, um, on my native plant gardens at all. Um, so about the cardboard, it certainly works. The mulch works too, and it's a lot easier. So that's, that's why I recommend this. And I never see this online. If you, if you research this, you're gonna find solarization with black plastic, you're gonna find digging up the grass, and you're gonna find, um, the, um, and you're gonna find layers of cardboard, the lasagna method, you, the cardboard, and then you put the mulch on top of it. I can tell you the mulch works by itself. So it's, it's easy. Um, you can certainly kill the grass and it's, it's a very small area. You can, it's not hard to dig up grass, it's shallow rooted. So, you know, take a spading fork and, and um, you can easily dig it up and then you can, you know, let it die in a sunny spot and then compost it. But um, it's not necessary. Um, if you mulch it heavily, it will still, um, you may have a little bit that comes up and certainly it's going to encroach from the edges, but it will work. Um, to do that. So nothing wrong with, with using cardboard, it's just easier to just start with the mulch. Did I answer all the parts? Is it too late this spring to do it? Oh, yes. Um, I would say no, no. Um, get out there and mulch now. Um, the grass is still dormant. Um, mulch now and, um, and you can plant into it in the, um, in the spring. Yeah, try it. I mean, certainly for a oh, small area, good. I would do it. Hmm. Yeah, you can, I mean, you can dig, from you can dig up the grass, mm -hmm. even in the spring, if, you, if you're going to dig it up, you can dig it up anytime. Becky LeBoy suggested uh, going out and renting a sod cutter if you want to uh, just cut to the chase and get down to the soil um, this time of year. Yes. Um, let's see. Um, uh, I love native viburnums, but I've had bad luck growing them. Are there particular tips or vulnerabilities to keep in mind with that genus? And someone else actually had asked earlier, are there any native viburnums? Because we keep talking about oh, the yes. non-native viburnums. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, I showed you viburnum dentatum, arrowwood viburnum, which is a beauty, really beautiful. There is, um, uh, we, Linda talked about um, opulus americanum, um, viburnum opulus variety americanum, um, which I call trilobum, and I need to do more research on that. Um, there is, um, uh, there are at least a dozen. There's probably more. Um, what's coming to mind is the prunifolium, which um, prunifolium meaning it looks like it's, it's a cherry leaf, viburnum prunifolium, which is a small tree, um, which is a, a real beauty. Um, uh, there's Nanny, Nudum, Nudum, viburnum Nudum, Nudum. It's a uh, yeah, I can't think of the. I forget, uh, name. The, I, I forget the common that, name. That one, that one is in the native plant garden at um, at the trail conference. Yeah, um, the um, and uh, oh my good names are not coming to me, but there are quite a few. Yeah, there are quite a few native viburnums. There's also a beautiful understory one. Those are all bigger plants. Uh, maybe they'll top out at 12 to 15 feet. There's a there's a real beauty that grows in um, in shade in the woods. Um, of viburnum maple leaf, maple and maple leaf, leaf viburnum. Yeah, and the leaves you've never seen a color like this. They turn lavender. 
oh my goodness, and purple, it's so beautiful. So if you have shade, um, more acid soil and shade. Um, I haven't had successful success with it because my soil, I think probably because my, my soil is only slightly acidic, but I, in a more acid soil, I would definitely try it. Um, that's a beauty and that's a smaller plant for shade. So there are probably a dozen, um, maybe even more, but there, yeah, a lot of them. But if you, um, if you um, look it up on the um, Use a Native Plant Database, at wildflower.com, we will get a list for New Jersey. So, so Elaine, we're coming right up to four o'clock here. There's still a lot of questions. A lot of people want your recommendations for hot, sunny driveways, hot, sunny balconies, hot, sunny yes. rooftop gardens. Uh, do you consult, blah, blah, blah. How can they reach you, Elaine? I do, I do consult. Um, I do. I don't want to travel too far because I don't charge for the travel time. So I would rather not. And I do a free consultation. So I'd rather not go too far. So I'm in I'm in Bergen County in Glen Rock and I don't go very far beyond the Glen Rock Ridgewood area. But um, you can reach me. You can reach me through the Bergen Passaic chapter. The emails that go to the Bergen Passaic chapter will come to me and to my co-leader, Tom Bender, and either of us can answer your questions. So if you specifically want me, just say that on the thing. But Tom is very knowledgeable as well, and he can answer your questions too. So and if you um, could say that email out loud, Elaine. So that's Bergen Passaic, Bergen Dash Passaic at nativepnpsnj.org. That's our chapter. It'll be on the website. Um, all the chapters' emails are on the website on the chapter page, which Randy maintains. So all the information. Millie maintains. <laughs> Millie maintains. Nearly maintains it, but you do the information. So um, the um, yeah, you can those emails come to me and to, and to um, my co-leader Tom Bender. So um, yeah, so you can uh, you can reach us through that. You can also join our mailing list. We have uh, uh, Hubert didn't mention it, but we have monthly um, webinars on the uh, second Wednesday of the month, and Randy will be our speaker in April. <laughs> so, uh, That's true. Yes. That's true. <laughs> So um, yeah, so um, look at look at the uh, the uh, organization's website, and you can yeah. reach us that way. Excuse so, me, it's you. under the thank contact you, page, and it's Bergen uh, Passaic as one word. Oh, mpsnj.org. It's on thank the you. contact page on the website. Mm -hmm. Emily, yeah. right. All right. Any 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 parting words, then Elaine, before you go, and then we're going to turn this over to okay. Millie, and I think it's yes. going to be the end of the conference very soon. Thank you, all, thank you all very much. And the dog is asleep, and he's very old, and I don't want to disturb him, so I'm sorry. So thank, thank you so much, Elaine. That was a wonderful <laughs> it was, presentation. It was a pleasure. Thank you all for hanging around. Thank you, Millie. I'm kicking it back to you and Hubert. Oh, okay. Hubert, do you have any final words for us before we uh, No, just thank let everybody for uh, joining us. And actually, Mike is supposed to be doing this. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> saying goodbye. Uh, so uh, thank you all for joining. And we hope you uh, join us uh, at the next uh, webinar coming up in April, right there. Uh, April 21st, 7 p.m. Uh, Deb Ellis will be talking. And uh, we hope you'll support us and join us in all our activities. So uh, goodbye and uh, have a nice uh, rest of the day. Thank you, Thank everyone. You, everyone. Bye. OK. OK, I can end it. End it. OK, let's save to chat. OK. Um, let's, let's um, Okay, if we can, oh, let me stop the... Uh...